has this book has this story of the of the uh, that weekend that memorable historic weekend uh, Camp David been on your mind all these years? What led you to <clears throat> write this book and to write it now? Um, no, it really it really wasn't on my mind. Um, you know, <clears throat> I teach at Yale and I, I teach courses on the global economy and also on American uh, involvement in the world economy. And these two lines intersect beautifully uh, on this one weekend. So I had known about the weekend, but I had, I had always assumed that there had been reams of stuff written about it and, and lots of books. And one day I thought, I'm gonna write a case study for my class. And I looked around and I saw that actually no one had written a book about it. Um, and that the only things that had been written were fairly technical analysis of the dollar and gold in the monetary system, or there, there were some very good chapters in other books, particularly one by William Sapphire, who was in the meeting and who took shorthand. So he had, a, and, and was a very colorful writer. Um, so I decided that, you know, the 50th anniversary is coming up. And of course, this, fifth, this summer is the 50th anniversary of a lot of things that Nixon did. <clears throat> the, the trip to China, you know, the, the angst over the Pentagon Papers. I'm sure there's a lot of other stuff. Um, and I said, well, <clears throat> I don't think this issue should be buried. And uh, I started to dig in and I realized that if I could tell the story through the people who were at Camp David, the people who were around the table, um, and I can make it understandable to anyone who reads Time Magazine, um, well, that would be a really interesting thing to try to do. So that's, that's what I set out to do. It took me about three years. Oh, the other thing is that I realized that there were several people who were at that meeting who were still alive. Um, and that I could interview them. And sadly, every one of them has died between the time I interviewed them and the time the book came out. But, um, you know, my, my, my timing was, uh, let's say, very fortunate and very, I was very lucky. In one of your notes, you mentioned that you visited the library in August of 2019, I think. Uh, what were, I'm sure there were many, but try to choose only the five or 10 highlights of that visit. And uh, uh, what resources uh, did the Nixon Library, the archives the re uh, offer to you in writing this kind of book? Well, let me just say it was a terrific experience being there. I, I couldn't have been greeted more warmly. Nobody, nobody knew uh, who I was. In fact, I'm not sure. Yeah, they knew what I was working on, but I'm not sure they even knew about this weekend. Um, so, uh, you know, it was, it was the middle of the summer. Uh, as you say, it was in August. Um, it was hot as blazes outside. And uh, I remember staying in a motel. Not, I'd never been to, 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 to that area of California. Um, but I was treated so warmly and <clears throat> the librarians were so accommodating. And, um, from transcripts to uh, files that, I mean, a really excellent filing system that almost took me day by day, but then I was dealing with a lot of people. I mean, I didn't want this to be a book only about Nixon because the decision that I wrote about was really about a bunch of very um, interesting people around the table, which I hope you know, we'll get to. Um, but they had files on all of this. And uh, I just, you know, I, I wanted to stay another week or two because it, it was so, it was so accommodating. And I felt, I felt, wow, I just, uh, you know, I had experience with one, with the Johnson Library, um, which was a good experience, but it wasn't, it wasn't like this. This was, uh, this was the ultimate in service. In, uh, can you describe the conventional wisdom about that weekend and about uh, the things that Nixon did then that existed from that weekend 
until I think the 6th of July, which was the pub date of your book. Uh, how does your book change the address the conventional wisdom and will it uh, will in 10 years or, in, or tomorrow, will that conventional wisdom begin to change? Well, um, <clears throat> I think the convention, I, I don't, I'm not sure I knew what the conventional wisdom was when I started, um, but I, I gradually realized that the, there were a couple of elements to the conventional wisdom. One was that everything Nixon did was simply to get reelected and that he didn't care about the longer term impact. And the second was that Nixon was responsible for the very high rates of inflation that occurred in the, in the latter 70s and early 80s. And that it was all a result of, <clears throat> of, of this weekend. And let me just say, you know, the, this weekend was really about uh, disconnecting the dollar from gold. All through this, the, the, the post Second World War era, the dollar was convertible to gold at a fixed rate. And Nixon and his team decided that that was no longer in the U.S. interest. Um, and there was, so it was a monumental decision because the link between the dollar and gold was one of the elements that accounted for the uh, very uh, phenomenal recovery of Japan and Germany from the war. Uh, it accounted for uh, a lot of the prosperity that the U.S. had in the 50s and the 60s. And so this was a very gutsy decision to delink the two. And they had to do it because <clears throat> over the years, the amount of dollars in circulation increased enormously, precisely because everyone thought, I'll hold all these dollars because I can always get gold for them. Um, but the ratio between the dollars and gold uh, changed dramatically. And just to give you an example, in, in, in the mid 50s, the U.S. had 160% coverage. That is, we, we had 160% more gold than we had dollars at, at the conversion rate that you know, what was in existence. But by 1971, we only had 25%. So we couldn't make good on the promise anyway. And to Nixon's credit, he called the spade a spade, but he used it. This was, this was what I hope I brought to the, to the table. He used it to create a different kind of monetary system that was still in the US interest, but that was much more realistic. And he did it and managed to preserve our political relationships around the world, our political and military relationships. And lest that sa sounds like a kind of a throwaway, the dollar was at the heart of international trade and finance and while the US may not have thought that was so important, for the Germanys and the Japans of the world, or the Englands and the Italys, this was the whole ballgame. This was their ticket to recovery. So Nixon took a very gutsy decision, but he made, on the other end, came out um, continued American leadership, continued strength of the dollar, uh, an international economy that was more conducive to more trade and more investment um, and, and stronger allied relationships. And, and above all, uh, international cooperation on economic issues. A anyone would have said that would have been destroyed. Nixon managed to actually enhance it. So um, I tried to knock down the conventional wisdom. And look, I'm sure, and I think I say this clearly in the book, he had an eye on, on the election. But then you tell me what president doesn't. Um, and when it comes to inflation, I'm not saying that delinking the dollar had nothing to do with inflation, but I'm saying along came right afterwards the quadrupling of oil prices, and that had a lot more to do with inflation. So, so um, I'd like to think that the conventional wisdom will change in this way, that this was a very well thought out decision. Um, and it was, um, it took a lot of courage. And Nixon, who is not noted for his interest in the international economic realm, and I bring that out, 
nevertheless managed to get a bunch of guys around the table who were. And he was, he, he exhibited considerable leadership in bringing them to a point where they made a decision, um, even though their perspectives were very different. I'd like to get to that a little later, because one thing I took from your book that not the least of his accomplishments uh, on that weekend was, a, uh, was an exercise in management and leadership, because he essentially herded 15 mm -hmm. or 16 cats who were extremely accomplished uh, individuals with very strongly held and conflicting beliefs. And he actually, through, through, through his unique uh, kind of uh, uh, presence and hidden hand, he was there, but he was frequently, he was around, but he wasn't always there. And he let them work it out themselves. And then he got a consensus, but that's down the road. Would I be right in saying that it was abhorrent to most instincts in his body to do a number of the things he did, particularly the wage price controls, but that I get from your book that in, in action was not an option at that point because there was a perfect storm where, where action, he had to take action. So it, there was really no choice. What action he would take was, was not decided, but he couldn't not act. Is that right? Yeah, I think that's right. He, he, um, um, he knew that staying where they were was not acceptable. And um, you know, I don't know that that was the world's most uh, brilliant insight because a lot of people were saying that. But in fact, he took the decision. You know, sometimes these dramatic decisions, there's a long lead up and they should have been made earlier. But he, 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 um, he, he, he went to the play. He, he took the bat. He, you know, he hit the home run. He wanted to do something. You, you make, sorry. No, I'm gonna say he, one of the things, you know, I, I didn't know very much about Nixon. So, I mean, I had read it for this book. I read everything I possibly could and talked to a lot of people, but he really wanted to make uh, a mark. He didn't want to do something that was seen as incremental. Um, and he was egged on by John Conley, who had been the governor of Texas and who was the only Democrat in the cabinet. But Conley and Nixon were basically, they had a lot of, a lot of uh, let's say political instincts in common. Conley had been at the, at the right hand of LBJ for a long time. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's, this surprised me. Nixon, of course, is seen as the ultimate political animal, but he didn't seem to have a lot of people around him who could discharge politics in the way he wanted. And he was very attracted to Conley as basically the only, the only real politician. I mean, he had a lot of great technocrats and a lot of great public servants, as I found out. But in terms of real political instincts, Conley was, was his number one guy. And Conley also reinforced Nixon's um, pension for doing something dramatic. And kind of, so the, the, they were, the, the, it was an extremely interesting relationship between these two, which I, I hope I brought out. Uh, I think you do. And, and it's, it's a curious case of opposites attracting because in terms of temperament and personality, uh, you couldn't have two more different people, no. which I think is like with, with Pat Moynihan. And, uh, it, it's what uh, ener uh, energized Nixon. Um, Tell you, you uh, I don't know whether it's quoting him or who you're quoting, but I remember the, you, you mentioned John Connolly's favorite parable, which kind of explains his approach to, um, to leadership and to politics. Was it something about a preacher being uh, uh, interviewed for a job? Yeah. Um, well, I, I don't remember the exact words there, but basically what Connolly, Connolly's motto was, I can basically deliver anything as long as you tell me what it is I have to deliver. Well, that was his thing. He'll preach any sermon. <laughs> you right. tell me what you, you tell, tell me, me what, what it is and I'll preach it. Yeah. And, and Conley's own words were, I can play it straight or I can play it round. I just have to know in advance, you know, what you want me to do. Um, but in some ways, this belittles, or let's say, it doesn't give Conley enough credit 
because he he reinforced Nixon's courage to take a big bold step, even though they could not have known exactly how the ball was going to bounce. I mean, they 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 had a lot of contingency plans, but they really didn't know. And so I think had it not been for Conley, there was nobody else around Nixon who was that strong when it came to the, you know, this issue of the dollar, gold, and the economy. Um, and just to just to repeat something you said, I keep focusing on the dollar and gold because that in a way was the most dramatic and the most enduring part. But basically what Nixon was saying was, I got to get the US economy moving. I, I, the worst thing that could happen here is that other countries come in and ask for gold and we don't have it because that would be like a run on the bank and we would be humiliated. And that would seep over into the sanctity of our commitments on, on defense. So I have to do this, but I also have to get, I have to do something about inflation. It's everybody was worried about inflation, although it wasn't very high. It's kind of like today, you know, where there's a lot of noise about it and nobody really knows, you know, what's, what's going to happen. So he did the total about face. I mean, this was Nixon to China, if, if, if ever there was one. He embraced uh, wage and price controls, which turned out to be a disaster. But it when he did it, it was extremely popular and it made, it, 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 it helped to, to generate growth. Um, and uh, it held down price, you know, held down inflation for a while. Uh, and, and he also um, established uh, uh, a lot of tax incentives for American industry. Uh, so he, it was a very broad package that had both international and domestic, uh, um, and it was, it was incredibly popular. The, the stock market on the day after his announcement, his announcement being August 5th, August 15th, uh, stock market um, shot up. Uh, order of magnitude larger than any time in its history. Um, you provide a, a really compelling backstory where uh, Nixon, you know, wasn't just him. Uh, it, there was a, a much broader context. He was, to begin with, he was the first president since Zachary Taylor for 120 years, not to have at least one house of the Congress with him for at least his first term. So he was, a, he had an opposition Congress um, public opinion, uh, there was a Harris poll, you quoted a Harris poll and a Gallup poll that people had lost early in the year, people had lost confidence. Uh, Newsweek, you quote, um, at a time when Newsweek meant something, uh, when, the, when the news magazines meant something that they said that uh, unless Nixon could uh, sort of spruce up the economy, it could be his Vietnam. And then this counterintuitive CEOs and Republican senators were calling for wage price control. So the world was upside down and Nixon, that was the context in which he, he acted. It wasn't that he just went up and decided autocratically that he, this was what he was gonna do. Oh yeah, no, it was, a, uh, you know, it's hard, it's hard to go back and put yourself in, you know, those days, but um, he was balancing a lot of things. Uh, you know, he, he, he was trying to reconfigure global politics with uh, the opening to China and the, the approach to Russia, uh, uh, to, to, to the Soviet Union on arms control. Um, and in the midst of this, here, there's this enormous economic crisis with the allies and he needed the allies, he needed a united front because going to China at that time, he the, le the, the worst thing would have happened is if there was carping on the part of uh, Europe or, or Japan. Um, and, uh, and, and likewise, and maybe even more so with the Soviet Union. He had to demonstrate that the US had the West you know, uh, on its side. And, and, and here you had this economic crisis which was affecting them. And so he basically, in the midst of everything, pushed for a, re a very big change and, man and managed to manage to not just contain the the, um, uh, the you know the angst, but also to come up with stronger alliances. So I think it was quite a quite a feat. 
you mentioned earlier the things that were happening in that year, and it was just uh, what two months earlier, almost to the day on the 12th or 13th of June, that the Pentagon Papers, the to that point, the largest leak of class of top secret classified documents, much less in wartime, uh, was leaked. And the administration had been plagued by leaks from its earliest days. One of the, I think one of the criticisms of the Camp David weekend, uh, and even the subtitle of your book is The Secret Weekend. Um, but is, is secrecy necessarily a bad thing? And could, could, this, could, could this weekend have occurred if, uh, if, if a broader, uh, if, if, if more people had been made aware of it and consulted? What, what was the role of secrecy in an effective decision-making? Well, that's a really great question because right after the weekend, I mean, Nixon announced everything that Sunday night. He broke into primetime TV and, and he was hesitant because the, the, at nine o'clock when he spoke, Bonanza was playing and Bonanza was, you know, uh, uh, apparently um, the entire country was watching. It was a big thing. And in people who expected Ben Cartwright and uh, Hoss and Little Joe <laughs> suddenly see Nixon appearing on their screen. So he was he was very conscious that he was preempting a very popular show. Yeah, he, he was. And, and the thing is, I tried to find out, I thought it would be an interesting detail to describe the episode, just very briefly. Oh, yeah. But what I found was they were reruns. It was August. And so even, <laughs> even though they were reruns, he made a big deal with his advisors. Is this, you know, is this the right thing to do? Um, uh, you know, anyway, um, the question of secrecy. The next day or the next week, a lot of criticism was levied at him from very respectable uh, officials of previous administrations saying, it was a real sin not to do this multilaterally. That the notion of sort of unilaterally declaring the outlines of the new monetary system um, and not confiding in our allies was really a very bad way to go. And they were all predicting that this thing would just create chaos. I thought a lot about that. And I, you know, my instincts, my, my just instincts from my own background were, maybe there's something to this, but as I thought about it, um, you know, it had to be done in secret because can you imagine a prolonged negotiation, what would have happened to the markets and what Congress would have done? Um, so he did something which I think took a lot of courage. He, he basically said, the U.S. is the center of the world economy. This is what we, this is our view of what needs to happen. We're willing, to, we're willing, in fact, we know we have to enter into negotiations with you, but let there be no doubt what we are saying. Um, and, you know, it, I don't know that we could pull that off today, but I think it was the right thing to do then because within three months, and as I detail in the book, there was a series of negotiations. Some of them were acrimonious, but within three months that came to a head uh, and, and they had an agreement. And basically, you know, they kissed and made up and we had a new monetary system or the beginnings of a new one. Um, so I think that he, it was the right way to go. You know, sometimes you have to be clear and sometimes, especially given our role, and sometimes you have to be very decisive. And then in the negotiations, I mean, we didn't get everything we wanted, but basically, you know, we put the marker down unambiguously. And uh, uh, I think it was, I think it was, it was very skillful. You tell the story of those negotiations and particularly uh, Secretary Connolly's role. In them. You, make it, you make it very exciting. Um, you also, there's a wonderful detail you have uh, when the the calls were made to uh, to Tokyo to inform them that this the world was about to uh, I hate to say blow up, but uh, um, well to them it was, to them to them it was yeah. So um, Secretary of State Rogers called uh, Prime Minister Sato uh, 
And Paul Volcker called the uh, advisor to the Ministry of Finance to tell them that in a couple of minutes, Nixon was going to go on and make this speech. But in those pre-cell phone and pre, uh, C even pre-CNN days, you describe them scrambling around to find a shortwave radio so they could listen to the speech on the Voice of America. Yeah. And that's the kind of detail you give that brings that brings it to life and makes it makes it makes it alive 50 years later. No, thank you. Thank you. What uh, you did mention, uh, you're, you're too much fun to talk to and we don't have enough time. So but you did mention and I want to talk to uh, you. You have such a deft hand uh, at describing people just on the basis of a couple of interesting or colorful details or a story or an anecdote. So can we do a lightning round of yeah some of the participants who were there. We've talked about John Conley, and he was fairly well known. He, in fact, was in the President Kennedy's and was shot uh, by Oswald, uh, right. or Ricochet, or however, Oswald, um, uh, in Dallas on uh, November 22nd. So he was a, a fairly well-known figure. But uh, George Schultz was not at that point. Don Rumsfeld used to say that very early in the administration, Nixon told him, you know, Nixon was describing the cabinet and the administration, and Nixon told him very early on that George Schultz was going to emerge as the star. So, and that did kind of happen. But at that point, it, well, it was a year into it, uh, George Schultz was a, the director of OMB. Right. Uh, what did, tell us about, what, what, what should we know about, what tells us about George Schultz? Well, Schultz um, came from the University of Chicago. Like you said, he nobody knew who he was. Uh, I think one magazine described him as the grayest of, of a the grayest of a gray cabin. Um, but he had very strong views, and they were free market views. And if there was one person there who was the connection to Ronald Reagan years later in terms of how the economy would evolve, it was Schultz. But he had a remarkable ability to say to Nixon, this is what I think, or this is what you gotta be really careful about doing. And then when the decision was made, Schultz would be the one that Nixon would uh, uh, count on to carry it out, even if the decision was totally different than what Schultz believed. Um, so I think that Schultz was a very important ingredient here um, in that he was, uh, he had great ideas or he had, let's say, uh, a very uh, important ideas, um, but he was an implementer. In fact, Nixon said he was the best, or I think at the time, the only economist in the, in the, um, in the cabinet he would rely on because he could actually get something done. I can't remember whether you quoted him about himself or someone about him, and I may be wrong entirely, but uh, was it that he was the only true conservative at, at that weekend? And if that's right, what did he mean by that? Or what do you think he meant by that? Well, I think, I think that's, that's true. Um, it meant that basically he believed in free markets. And when he saw, you know, he, he wasn't really trained. He was a labor economist. He wasn't really trained in the international side, but the notion of the dollar being hooked to something like gold to him was an anachronism. He thought the currency should float up and down just like everything else, you know, uh, responding to supply and demand. And he was a conservative. I think, uh, I mean, he was a true conservative. He wanted minimal regulation. I mean, Nixon, Nixon he made Nixon look, you know, very moderate. Um, and, and the funny thing is, is you know, I'm not an expert on Nixon, but at, after all the research I did, he really was, he, I think he was a moderate Republican, uh, you know, certainly by, by today's standards. And he had some, I mean, the, the difference between him and, uh, uh, and the, the Democratic presidents were sometimes much more about how you achieve a, an end, not what the end was. Um, but, but, but Schultz definitely was, uh, way over on the conservative side. Our former colleague, uh, John Price, who was on Pat Moynihan's staff, has just published a terrific book, and he's not going to be best pleased because I can't remember the title, but it was something like The Last Liberal Republican, and it makes this case that Nixon was surprisingly uh, 
enlightened as you look at it, although the conservatives, I don't think, looked at it that way, in terms of uh, his domestic or a lot of his domestic policies. So it, it's a terrific book, just, uh, just published. Um, how about uh, one of uh, somebody who was not well known or widely known and has a terrifically interesting backstory that you present is Paul Volcker. Who was he? In addition to being uh, 100 foot feet six, tall. Seven, six, six, seven. seven. Yeah. And he, what did he have a problem? Where did he, where was it that the, the, he went on, they sent him on a government plane and he couldn't fit in the bunks, so he had to sleep on the floor? <laughs> yeah, well, what, right after Nixon made his announcement, so it was nine o'clock on Sunday, August 15th. 1971, they knew that they had to get to the allies right away. I mean, there was no advanced consultation. So they sent Paul Volcker, who was the undersecretary of the treasury and who nobody had ever heard of outside of government circles. Um, they sent him on a mission with two other guys to fly overnight so that when the sun rose on Monday morning in Europe, uh, Volcker would be there. But they gave him a troop transport, but he couldn't, he was too, he was too uh, tall to sleep in the cot. So he just slept on the floor. But, but you know, on a more serious uh, uh, note, um, Volcker, Volcker um, had a different view of the global economy than Schultz. And one, one really interesting thing is the diversity of views that Nixon got around him and listened to. So Schultz was a free market guy Volcker was not. Volcker basically felt that the dollar should be backed by gold. And if it wasn't going to be backed by gold, we had to have some firm commitment as to what it would be valued against. And, um, but he was a good soldier too, you know, after this decision, he went to Europe and he ultimately went to Japan and he was one of the leaders of the negotiations to bring it to kind of a you know, to a conclusion of a, a, a different kind of monetary system. Um, you have to jump around because time is passing. Yeah. One of the really interesting figures is, uh, and you, oh, and you make the point that except for, I think Arthur Burns, who was in his 60s, the most common denominator of this group was that it was really young or uh, really 46 was the average age, something like that. And pulling that average down must have been Pete Peterson, who was a really, uh, had been and was and then continued to be and and even more so a really interesting and important figure um and i think you came across him later did you at blackstone or yeah i worked at you, blackstone. you knew you knew him what was pete peterson like and what did he contribute what did he bring to nixon and what did nixon bring to him generally and at camp david on that weekend 50 years ago today well um I tried to write about Peterson as he was then. In fact, all these guys, because you know they went on to very illustrious careers, and I really tried to discipline myself to say, okay, it's 1971. You know, who were they? Nobody had heard of Peterson either. He, he had been very young head of uh, Bell and Howell, but he was the only one in the Nixon entourage who actually had hands-on business experience. And uh, he and I think it's safe to say he and Nixon did not get along very well. Um, Peterson was very involved with the Georgetown set. Peterson was a, a major self promoter. And I'm not sure how much of a conservative he was. I think he would have been, he could have been in, he could have been in, in the Democratic Party. Looking but, back, wasn't his one of his primary things, and he wrote a paper that was that was and remained very influential, uh, that he was a tech visionary. And that was something right. I was unique say, at that time, but much less in the administration that he really brought. Well, what he brought was two things. One is, and I saw this when I worked for him, uh, enormous capacity to assimilate information. And he wrote a report, which Nixon loved which was called, I think it's the uh, America in a Changing Global Economy. And he described, he, he provided the intellectual framework uh, in which all these decisions were made over that weekend at Camp David. Um, and Nixon was so enthralled by the explanation, uh, the report was done before the weekend, obviously, that he, he 
wanted Congress to see it. He wanted everybody to see this report. I mean, a lot of people write reports, but Nixon loved this one. But then Peterson went on to say something else, which did not get a lot of attention. But it was that, you know, we can blame other countries for our problems. We can say the dollar is too strong. We can say we need more trade uh, concessions from other countries. But ultimately, it's all about what we in invest in ourselves. And in our system, if we invest in ourselves, nobody could touch us. And he said, we're not investing in technology. We have no plan. Um, he said, you know, we need a longer term plan. And my buddies, Peters are talking, in industry, all agree, this is not some socialist thing. They're watching Japan, they're watching Europe, they're projecting that governments are gonna get more involved and we have to have an answer to this. And secondly, we've got to invest in our workforce because the time is coming when automation is gonna create a two tier country with all these low paying jobs, you know, and, and we, have to, we have to get in front of that. Now, the truth is, as far as I can tell, I may be wrong about this. Nixon didn't have much time for this. I mean, I don't blame him. He, he had a lot of other things on his mind and, and Peterson was talking 10, 10 years into the future. But I thought it was great that around the table he had, he didn't like Peterson, but he had him there. Um, and, and now you have Schultz, the free marketer, Volcker who wants to fix exchange rates, Peterson, who's talking about something totally different, um, you know, and, and uh, uh, it was, you know, it was, I think, I, I, and you mentioned, mentioned this before. Um, Conley, by the way, I, I didn't bring this point out, who was basically would have been at home in the Trump administration. He was an America first guy. His motto was, let's screw the foreigners before they screw us. Before they screw us, yes. Uh, um, and Nixon, he orchestrated the meeting with all of these people. And, you know, I, I read nothing that would say, tell me he knew the details of all this stuff, although I think he knew a lot more than other presidents did, you know, have. Uh, he really, he may not have understood the workings of the global economy, but he understood the political dimensions and he understood that ultimately the goal was to preserve an open world economy, not to close it. Uh, and he had to, he had to kind of orchestrate. There's one other person too, who wasn't at the meeting, but who was brought in right afterwards. And that was Kissinger. Because yes, Kissinger and neither Kissinger nor Rogers were there. And, it, you know, it was a meeting that had, that, that they knew was going to have international ramifications. So what's up with that? Well, I think, you know, I don't think Nixon valued Rogers' judgments on this stuff. I mean, he valued Rogers on other things, but not this. And he saw state as a sieve. And he saw state as a sieve, absolutely. Um, and Kissinger was negotiating with the North Vietnamese as this meeting was going on. Actually, he was I, in Paris that week, wasn't he? Was he? Paris, on the yeah. way, yeah. But the day after he, he jumped into the pond because uh, the Europeans and the Japanese were apoplectic and Kissinger's staff uh, mentioned, or not mentioned, uh, alerted him to the fact that this could be a huge foreign policy problem. And so part of my book is about these two polar opposites, Kissinger and Connolly, couldn't, couldn't imagine two people who were diff more different, but had enormous respect for each other and also were afraid of each other. They weren't gonna get in, in each other's way. And the two of them together managed to bring this acrimonious negotiation to a, to a resting place. I, I, it, it, was a, it was a real team of rivals. Yeah. And uh, if you had been, uh, and if they'd been really smart, you would have been on one of those choppers, either from the South Lawn or from the Pentagon, who would you have chosen to shadow for that weekend? Who's the, who, who, did, who did you? Or would you, and who do you now find the most interesting of those 15 or 16 people that went or showed later came? By the way, when you say 15 or 16, that includes uh, some staff. I have only six or seven principals. 
Um, you know, I can't really answer that. But to me, the most interesting part of the of going into the the personalities of these men, uh, and of course, it was all white men. I mean, you know, there's there's there was not not a hint of, of sort of ethnic or gender diversity, um, but it was it was 1971. Um, I was fascinated by the Kissinger Conley uh, tension and relationship because there you have the United States in the international realm writ large. You have Conley who's basically a very hardliner saying we should grab everything we can. And you have Kissinger saying, no, you need a, a structure that, ha that is sustainable and that may cause, that may require the U.S. to not to not to grab everything. We need alliances. But, you know, we have had a history of engagement and retreat from the world. In some ways, these two men, you know, were, were parts of this. And, and, and uh, the, the, the different ideas, the way they got together, the way Kissinger managed them, to me, that was really interesting. I was also, I was very interested in, uh, um, in Peterson, not because I, I subsequently knew him, but I thought he was kind of a visionary. The, the notion of investing in ourselves, which of course is a very big issue right now. Um, I think if I look, look at the last several de decades, we didn't invest in ourselves the way we should. I mean, I'm not saying there wasn't a lot of investment, but you know, um, I think that, that our financial system became much more of a casino that we, that Wall Street drifted towards activities where you make money on money as opposed to investing in the real economy. And that's coming home to roost right now. Not, I'm not even thinking about competitiveness, but just the deterioration of our social fabric. So when, Kish, when, when, when when Peterson said we've got to invest in the workforce, that you know too many of these people are not going to have jobs or good jobs because technology is going to it's going to substitute for them. How great it would have been if that was a bigger theme earlier on. And I'm not just saying Nixon. I mean it was it was Nixon all the way through. It was Nixon, Ford, Carter. You can go on. But Peterson rang the right alarm. I, I'm looking at the clock on the wall, and the hands are not my not my friend. Uh, not the least uh, terrific thing about your book is that you pay Nixon the respect of taking seriously um, his interest in the speech and his belief in the importance of the speech and the attention he paid to the speech. And in a lot of cases, he had to, it was a stiff, stiff learning curve, curve for some of the people who either didn't get it or thought it wasn't all that important or wanted to stuff it full of stuff. And you go, one of the things you do, and Nixon insisted on it be short, so it was about 20, 22 minutes, and you take it paragraph by paragraph and deconstruct it in a really interesting way. It's a masterclass, among other things, of speech writing. But there's a couple of quotes you, uh, and, and he worked with Bill Sapphire, and although in the end, I think Nixon essentially wrote it himself. But um, he told Sapphire, you quote him, he told Sapphire, make it who was doing, who was the writer of record, make it, what did he say? Make it beautiful, make it, make it, make it, Wait, make it word, don't make it brutal and beautiful, make it beautiful, beautiful, brutal and effective. And effective, right. What, what was, what, 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 what did he mean by that? Well, I just tell this, the very short story that um, <clears throat> Sapphire, when Sapphire arrived, at Camp David, everybody understood that the speech was going to be a really big deal, because normally speechwriters are not at those Camp David meetings. Um, and I think Sapphire felt he's going to draft the speech, and he spent all Friday night into early Saturday morning writing the speech, only to find that Nixon had also spent all night, and that when Sapphire got to a Rosemary Woods cabin. 
at 7 a.m. she was typing away the notes that Nixon had had got somebody to slip under her door. Um, and so it became obvious from the beginning that this was Nixon's, Nixon was gonna write this speech and Sapphire was gonna, um, he was gonna uh, help with the, the technical parts. And, and you know, Nixon had, I think he had in mind a speech that was brutally effective and that it came right to the point. And he didn't want any flowery words on any sort of cliches about, you know, America's role in the world, this being the American century or anything like that. So it was kind of, the, the, the speech was very, very straightforward. And uh, I got a lot of help in thinking about it from Lee Hubner, who was, uh, had a lot, of, lot to do with the Nixon speech writing team. Oh, and, and another very good friend of the foundation and the library and, and uh, a, a teacher of Nixon at GW and, uh, and an author, yeah. Yeah, and, but he, he really educated me on how Nixon thought about speeches and uh, how he dealt with the speech writers. And, um, you know, that in itself was really interesting because uh, he understood the power of words. I think he also understood the power of television and he was, you know, I remember he said uh, on Saturday morning, none of his advisors, nobody understood television the way they should. He was very upset about that. But uh, Didn't he wanted uh, the speechwriters to underline in red the three things in, in their drafts that they wanted to get across on TV? Right. That was, yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, he said, you know, you, you can write a speech and, and you bury, bury the lead somewhere. That's terrible. What is it you want the press to pick up? And when you give me a draft, I want to see underlined what you think the press is going to pick up. One, I want to make sure that's what I want them to pick up. And two, it, I want to make sure that you have written it in such a way that they will pick it up. Um, yeah, it was a, a, a kind of interesting. Final question, and it's it's sort of off topic, but it's I think it's very much on topic. And it, to me, it's one of the most memorable scenes in your book. It's the Saturday night when the other the, all the other the guys are in various meetings and such like. And Nixon is in his uh, cabin in, and, uh, in his lodge, and he asks for um, Herbs, is it Herb Stein, Cap Weinberger, and someone else to come over to talk, oh, no, Haldeman, Ehrlichman, and, and uh, Weinberger, wasn't it, to come over and talk politics with him at 10 o'clock right, right, at night. Right, 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 yes. And Haldeman describes that they, that, well, they, they get there and the thing is dark, can you, pick up that story well, it's mid-august it's <laughs> very hot and they walk into the aspen lounge the a a aspen lodge which is where nixon is and uh the lights are very dim and he's got a fire going and he's sitting there by the fire i mean it, it really is you know, i don't know what to say uh, um uh, so it's pure nixon for it's throughout his life every at every stage of his life, the, the power of a fire and a fireplace at, in, in, in any a fireplace for all seasons. Yeah, and they, you know, and they talk, it's almost, a bit, I had a feeling it was relaxation and it was stuff they really were interested in. It was almost like, you know, we've gone through, we're, we're here in this weekend, we're dealing with a lot of difficult issues and they are ultimately technical too, you know, wage price controls, tax breaks, the monetary system. Let's talk about what we were really interested in. And, uh, you know, it was clear that Nixon knew more about politics than any of them. He could go state by state. And I, you know, again, this wasn't a book. I, I, didn't, I, I didn't even purport to write a book about Nixon, but the, the impression I got was he loved, he loved politics. You, you quote Haldeman's diary, in where Haldeman writes that Nixon was in full mystic mode in sitting in the dark and talking about national character. And that if you, in, in a way about investing in yourself, that, that the Germans and the Japanese and the Chinese had it, they believed in themselves and that he was afraid we'd lost it. Um, I, if the final, final question. Um, what, is there anything that President, the POTUS 46 could learn from the hard won wisdom uh, of POTUS 37 on that weekend uh, and, and its surroundings 50 years ago this weekend? 
Well, I think that, I mean, to answer that question so that it doesn't look like pop, pop history, we have to acknowledge what's different. Um, so the US has nowhere near the unilateral power it had then, just the fact. I'm not saying we don't have the capacity to lead, but we have to deal with a lot of other countries in a way that we did then. And secondly, we are much more integrated into the global economy. It, it makes the, what happens outside of our country economically much more important to us than it was then. Um, so I don't, wanna, I don't wanna say that there are lessons because today's leaders are stupid and I'm not, you know, didn't do what Nixon did. They're facing a lot of different uh, problems. And, and, and the third, of course, is there was nothing like China then. Um, the Soviet Union presented no real economic threat. Um, and I, I see China as being the biggest, the biggest uh, rival that we have had maybe ever. In any event, certainly in the economic realm, their power to be reckoned with. Having said all that, here's what I think President Biden, if President Biden were to read my book and ask the question, what should I take from this? I would say a couple of things. One is <clears throat> um, the US needs to be very clear about what it wants. It, it doesn't mean that it's gonna get everything it wants, but one thing Nixon did was he made it very clear that we are entering a new era. He recognized that it was a new era. He defined what that new era was. And as a result, I think he preserved a lot of scope for American leadership. And while there's a lot of different stuff today, you know, it's not always very clear, what is it that we really want to do? And do we know, do we know it? And have we articulated it? Because I think what Nixon understood, and I would say that this is different, different era, but it's not so different on this point. I think most of the world wants us to be to lead. I think they do. I mean, they may not say that, and they, they you know, they'll they'll um, complain about U.S. arrogance or this or that. But they, there is nobody else. There is nobody else with our full set of characteristics. And so, and I'm not saying leadership is. I'm not talking about the Marshall Plan era or anything. I'm just saying in our system, in our era, we can still lead. I believe we are entering a whole new era. And what I would take from Nixon is he got, he, he, he went up to the plate and he, um, you know, he took the bat and he hit the ball and he hit it really hard. Um, the second thing is that we need a lot of things from the world um, and we should certainly go after them. Um, but uh, <clears throat> We have to um, realize that it's a multi it's a multilateral system, uh, much more than it was then, and uh, we should try to strengthen it, not weaken it. I you know I think that Conley couldn't have cared less about the global economy, but there was Nixon and Kissinger who basically reined him in, and as a result. We got a lot of what we wanted and the world economy became more open. And, and I think that, you know, as President Biden looks around, he's doing a lot of America first things. I don't begrudge him that. He's talking about buy America. He's got the tariffs on, you know, he's, I think, winding up for a lot more domestic focus. But I hope he doesn't lose sight of the global economy and the importance of more trade and more investment and Nixon was able to balance that. And Nixon understood, understood the need to balance that. So that's the second thing. The third is that Nixon surrounded himself with um, real diversity. Not, it wasn't ethnic diversity or gender diversity, but it was diversity of ideas as we've talked about. And it took a leader to do that, you know? And it took a leader to basically keep, the, keep the, those horses in tow. And he did it. Um, and, uh, you know, I think they had enormous respect for him. Uh, 
So, so you know, those are some of the things that, uh, you know, that come to my mind. I, I, if I could emphasize one point, it would be this. Nixon understood that we were entering a new era with China, with the Soviet Union and the world economy. Um, and he actively tried to shape this new era. We can argue what he did right, what he did wrong. Of course, the great tragedy of, of how the, the, you know, the administration imploded. It's so unfortunate all that happened. And I'm not minimizing how horrible it was, but you know, he, he, he at least started this effort to redefine the, the new era and America's role in it. <clears throat> and I think with China and with the cryptocurrencies um, and, and with all the domestic issues that we have, we're entering a new era now. And I don't see anybody defining it the way the Nixon team did. And so if I, if I had two minutes, just two minutes with Biden, I would, that's the point I would look at is say, help us, help us know where we're headed. It doesn't have to be highly detailed, but the big moving parts and where do we fit in and how do we chart this course? And in the end, that was, I think, really the, the big, the big picture of, of, of the three days at Camp David. Well, Jeffrey Garten, thank you so much for taking this time with us, for writing a great book, Three Days at Camp David, How a Secret Meeting in 1971 Transformed the Global Economy. It's available at the library bookstore and at bookstores and retailers everywhere and online as, a, as an ebook, as an excellent ebook with great uh, index and notes, uh, very well formatted. So thank you for that. And uh, come back to your Belinda soon. We'll treat you as well or better. You can't treat me any better. I was well. Uh, well then we'll we'll equal uh, we'll uh, we'll equal our prior uh, treatment. Thank you again so much. It was a real pleasure. Thank you. Take care.